Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I had my debate with Fidel Soliman from the Bridges Foundation. Overall, it was very cordial, very respectful. It was a great discussion, a great back and forth. More of a discussion than a debate, which was totally fine. I got a chance to talk about my issues with Kula Atan Aruf. He got a chance to respond to me. I let him say as much as he wanted to say. And likewise, I got to push back a bit on what he was saying. And I also got a chance to bring up some contradictions in the Kula Art mentioned some of the scholarly views, had a chance to talk with him about how a roof is not just dialects. And overall, it was a great, great discussion. I'm making this video just to condense a lot of this because it was like a two hour discussion. And obviously two hours is a lot to ask for anyone just to sit through and watch. So I'm going to condense it to the points relevant to the Qur'at and that roof and the perfect preservation of the Quran. And then I'll post the full whole video uh, some point afterwards for anyone who wants to go through that. So let's watch the first clip. There's a worrying trend, and I think you may have noticed this as well, uh, Fidel, that there are some Muslims in the Ummah who are not familiar with the other recitations besides Hafs. They have this idea of, I think, what you might call Hafs normativity, that there is just one reading, and it's just this one. It's the one that most Muslims in the world have. About 95% of the Muslims in the world have the Hafs reading and I've never read or perhaps even aren't even familiar about the different readings that are available, the other nine that are valid by Islamic scholarship. And I mean, it got to the point where I heard people, I heard um, a father tell his son, actually, that there is only one reading of the Quran. There's only one. And it's it's this one. And I thought, well, that's, that's not technically true. I mean, there's meant to be the ten Qur'at. And uh, I wish that that father would tell his son about that one day. So he would be knowledgeable in this. I want to make the point that I don't, I'm not arguing against preservation as such. I'm not saying that you cannot say the Quran is preserved because of the Qur'an. That's not my point. I think you can make an argument that the Quran is preserved in very similar ways that you can for the Bible, for example. But I would say that anyone who thinks that the Quran is perfectly preserved, and by that I mean letter for letter, word for word, dot for dot, halakha for halakha, they're that particular perspective, I think, is flawed. And I think that isn't true. And in the quest for objectivity, you might say, I would like Muslims to know this so that they do not repeat this because I think it is an error. And there are scholars who repeat this. Um, Yasser Qadi has made this point, for example, that he thinks the Quran is perfectly preserved. Um, letter for letter, dot for dot. There's some others as well. And I think it's best for the sake of the Ummah and for the sake of that objectivity to clarify this, that you can say the Quran is preserved, but to say that it's perfectly preserved, as in the text is perfectly preserved, I think is an error. Do you want to come back yeah. to that? Okay, Fadal? thank Maybe you. Some thoughts on that? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Number one, no, the, the Quran is preserved, word for word, letter for letter, not because Muslims did a good job preserving it, but because God did not give the... Um, responsibility of preserving the Quran to any human being. So I make my point quite clear. I'm not arguing against some generalized preservation concept. I'm arguing about the idea of a perfectly preserved text, letter for letter, word for word, dot for dot. I don't believe that's true at all. And I think it's evident through the Islamic traditions and through scholarship about those traditions. Fidel does actually hold to the position that this is perfectly preserved, the Quran is perfectly preserved, letter for letter, word for word, dot for dot, and he goes on to give his reasons why. It's important to understand that me and Fidel both agree on quite a lot of things regarding the killer art, namely the fact that there is 10 killer art, there are 10 different readings of the Quran. He considers them to be all Quran. I question that. I, I find that suspicious. But he thinks they're all Quran. And he quoted from his book, actually, when he said about 30% of the Qur'at are differences in meaning. In fact, he says it's quite substantial difference in meaning. These aren't light changes. These are quite heavy changes. And I think that's important because not many Muslims know about this and not many Muslims want to acknowledge that this is the case. But you raised two different things, Ahruf and Qur'at. And those are two separate things. Completely separate. And I'll tell you why. If we have 10 Qur'an, because one of the things you said in uh, to Sneeko is that there is 10 Qur'ans, because there is 10 Qur'at. Well, let me give you more than that. Every Qari gave two narrators, two different narrators. So, for example, Hafs took from Asim. So the Qari is Asim. That's the Qari. 
and he he has two main students, Asim and Shu'ba. Nafa' has two other students, Warsh and Qaloon. Warsh is very close to Shu'ba and Asim. And Qaloon and Nafa' is very close to Hafs and Asim. So for your info, the 10 Qurra, the 10 Qaris had about 20 narrators. So you could have told him there is 20 Qurans also, by the way, but there isn't. It's only one Quran that is that encloses these uh, Qiraat, which 30% of its variations are not performance. They affect the meaning so much. Meanings become completely different, but not one contradiction between any of them. This doesn't mean that we have 10 or 20 Qur'ans. We have one that the mean, because if an ayah has two different qira'at or three different qira'at, some ayat, some ayat, which is the maximum, can have four different qira'at in one ayah. In one ayah. And I'll, I can give you an example, by the way. This means that the meaning of the ayah is the collective meaning of the four qira'at together. And when you put them, it's like putting layers of meanings above each other that become clearer and clearer until the ayah become vivid, becomes so it's like high, high, uh, high, uh, what do you call this? high definition. So how does Fidel reconcile the fact that there is this different qira'at and in, often in very specific ayahs or very specific verses of the Qur'an, there are sometimes up to four different Qur'a on that verse. The way Fadal synthesizes this is that he takes each one of those different meanings and he basically says you have to combine them. You affirm all of them at the same time as being true, as being the case. Now this is going to be problematic, I think, and we'll see later on in this video how that pans out. But this is his way of dealing with the fact that there are different Qur'an readings with different meanings and quite substantial different meanings in some places. So Fidel holds opinion, which I don't think is, is that popular academically. Maybe I need to read a bit more into this, but the idea that the Aruf, the seven different modes, which the Hadith tell us that the Quran was revealed to Muhammad, he thinks they are just dialects. He thinks there is no actual difference in any of these. They are just different dialects, and hence there is no change in meaning. That is his view, but I challenge this because I think there are issues with this. Let's watch this next clip. Tell me. Just, just to say, if the Al-Awuf is, is just dialects or is synonyms, it is still a recitation from, from Muhammad who got it from Jibril, who gets it from Allah. Yes, of course. And my understanding would be that the companions would not leave things that they were told was Quran. As, as you said, all this Al-Awuf is Quran. Every half is Quran. So would the companions, why would they have abandoned this? It, it seems as if they wouldn't exactly. Have. The, the companions would never do something like that except if the prophet did it himself or allowed it. The companions were even afraid of collecting the Quran in a form of a book because he didn't command it. And then they 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 used their intellect and they said, no, this is much, this is definitely better. And they, they took the decision. So uh, do you think that people were afraid just to collect it in a form of a book would, would take their, 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 their decision to remove six? Why remove them? Why not keep them all? Well, you see, what I've been reading from scholars uh, like Dr. Yasser Qadi is that there is a debate over the Aruf and whether or not the Aruf is still around today. There's a question over what the Aruf is, and there are different opinions. Uh, you know, Dr. Yasser Qadi gives 12 of them, and he highlights three of them as being good contenders for what Aruf is. Uh, one is dialects, although he admits it's difficult because dialects to whom? Like you got the Quraysh, you may have uh, like a tribe in Yemen, but there's Tamim no and, consensus. Yeah, all those, yeah. and they speak very differently. Yeah, there's, mm, there's, there's no consensus over which seven tribes this is referring to. Um, so for that reason, it, it, it seems odd that, for example, the oral tradition wouldn't preserve that knowledge. Why would the companions not know if this was dialects into which tribe, why would that not be preserved? Why would that not be because it's abrogated? In the sunnah? Anything abrogated. I mean, well, okay, in the Quran, there is something called abrogation. Means Allah can make the Prophet forget and everyone forget, and the ayah vanishes. So when we say that six ahruf vanished, abrogated verbally, it means vanished. So you see, the Sahaba themselves are even trying to remember what exactly was it. It's gone. 
it's gone. And this is there also in some uh, ayat. Well, well, the, Omar said, I, I, am, I am sure definitely that stoning was in the Quran. But he doesn't remember the ayah. And no one remembers the ayah. And they started like to, trying to come up with things that actually sounded funny, like as shaykh wa shaykh. That's not Quran. Um, and the other point is, is even, even if this is the case, I would still argue that from a merely a scholarly perspective, perfect preservation cannot be true. Because if you've got six out of seven, and these are all Quran, this is all authentic Quran, there is no distinguishing between any of them, although you, maybe you'd say the, the hafs of the Quraysh is better or something, but they're all Quran. And if they're all now gone, when they were actually in use, they had been recited from the Prophet, then effectively you have six out of seven different modes of the Quran lost. No, because we don't know lost. where they are today. No, not lost. Well, they were not. No, no, no. Only one of them is enough because that's what the hadith says. Uh, any one of them is sufficient. But the qiraat, not one is sufficient. You have to add, to, to collect all the qiraat in order to understand the whole meaning of the ayah if the ayah has different qiraat. So because Fidel Solomon holds the idea that the Aruf is just dialects and varying dialects with no actual change for the meaning, he also holds to the idea that they were abrogated. In other words, Muhammad was given seven different ways of reciting the Quran. They were just dialects according to Fidel. Then when he went to tell people about them, not long after doing so and just before his death presumably, he abrogated them. His evidence for this is not an explicit hadith as far as I could understand from what he was saying, but rather it is a hadith which talks about how Muhammad was reciting the Quran to Jibreel um, during the, the last Ramadan, I believe. And then during this, it mentions somewhere that he only recited it in one half, which is one of the seven different dialects. And that was sufficient. And this is good enough to infer that therefore this is abrogating the other six. I don't know. I, I, I couldn't find this. If someone can find this for me, I'd love to see it. But I don't think the hadith that says that also has the the only recited in one half bit. I don't know. Maybe I missed that. If someone could find that for me, that would be that would be awesome. But I don't think this is an explicit command for abrogation. And I think that's also a very contentious point in scholarship. In this next clip I'm going to show you, I bring up the hadith that mentions two different people who are both from the same tribe, the tribe of Quraysh. I wanted... Fidel to try to explain how it's possible the Aruf is just differences in dialect if two people who disagreed on the Aruf and brought it to Muhammad for him to explain it both came from the same tribe so they would have spoke the same way. Let's watch this clip. Okay, okay. you put it in Psalm 7 is it what I'm saying. It was revealed so, this way. The Quran has been revealed to be recited in seven different ways. Okay, perfect. Good. So yeah, the Prophet yeah. mentioned that there are seven different ways to yes. recite. Good. And, and yeah. this is our oath and they are, they, they are yeah. all collect. It's all good for you to do so. And you know, maybe one half is, is equivalent. You only need one half. You know that? Absolutely fine with yeah, that okay. as well. But yeah, okay. they are different and they are all recitation of the Quran. So yeah. to lose them is to lose six out of seven or roughly about no, 85%. continue the hadith. Continue. He said, read in any one of them, the one that is easy for you. So it is a rukhsa. It is something to make recitation easy. Different from the qiraat. The qiraat are carrying different meanings. This is not carrying different meanings. That's why I'm is telling you. That's why the... I am for the, the, the I, am, I am, I support the opinion that says it was dialects. Okay. I, okay. Or, or even so, it's synonyms, but it, it it's carrying the same meanings. So, are you aware of the hadith where it talks? Uh, actually, no. Sorry, it, it is this hadith. Um, these two people, Umar bin Al Khattab and uh, Hashim bin Hakim, they are from the same tribe of Quraysh. Is that correct? Yes, of course. So, if they're from the same tribe of Quraysh, how can it be a difference in dialect? Amazing. Remember that hadith that I told you. The Prophet was worried about who. The old woman, the old man, the little boy, the little girl, and the man who is unlearned and never read a book before. Neither Umar al Khattab nor Hisham ibn Hakim fall into these categories. I am now talking to you in English, though I'm not an Englishman. Why? Because I know English and I love to speak in English. Sometimes I speak with my children in English. I love English, but I'm not English. So same thing. If there are Sahaba who are masters, mastering the science of the Quran, and they know the Ahruf, why don't they get train themselves on it and recite with it in their Salah? And, and, and because they're going to teach it to the other tribes. Okay, but 
they're from the same tribe, right? So I don't think this would be an issue of dialect. So whatever they're arguing about, and remember, he, he considers this very severe. He drags him by the neck, I think it says. This is very serious. When he, and he yeah. even says, what was the Sora you were saying? Now, he thinks it's a al he can, he can He can understand enough of it to know what he's trying to say. But the way he phrases it is, what is this Sora you are saying? So he yeah, thinks yeah. there's a difference here. Yeah, because um, Amr was not is, aware about that le- yet. But Hisham was a younger man, yes. and he was given this because he he's, he's going to teach. So yeah, he is he 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 would like to train himself on the other dialects too. Uh, by the way, sometimes I speak in a Lebanese dialect. I like that, just because I visited Lebanon several times. That's it. But I love it. So doesn't mean that, I think this that, is. Yeah, hmm. I, I was good. just saying. I think this is good reason to think this isn't just dialects. If this was dialects, I don't think this this would be the response they would have. Um, again, they're from the same tribe. Whatever so it was. It's a bit, Whatever it was, like if I was from Liverpool and you were from Liverpool, we would both speak in a Scouts accent, right? So dialects wouldn't be the issue. We would both have the same terms for the same things. Speaking even the accents down to the way we speak would be the same. So whatever this issue they have, it must be more substantial than just dialects. And and that for me is sufficient enough to say that a roof is not not just dialects. It's it's something more than than dialects. No, it's it's uh, anyway it's dialects or synonyms or whatever. If I know a different way to recite, why don't I recite it and get trained on it? That, that's it, whatever it was. Okay, so in this next part, I bring up what I think is probably one of the best contradictions to bring up in regards to the different Qur'at, and that's to do with Surah Al-Hud, Surah 11, Ayah 81. And I actually quote a scholar here, Marin Van Putin, who specifically mentioned this in a long Twitter post, where he went through explaining why there is a variant reading in two of the Qur'an out of the ten that basically change what happens in the story. And what makes this really difficult is the same story, and it's the story of Lot and Lot's wife leaving from Sodom and Gomorrah as it's about to be destroyed through God's judgment. In other parts of the Qur'an, it clearly says that Lot did not, Lot's wife stayed in Sodom and Gomorrah. She did not leave. But in one of these Qur'an variants, it says that she did leave. I think that's a contradiction because both cannot be true at the same time. It's about a specific story that occurred historically and the Quran affirms the correct response in different places. So in essence, there cannot be a Quran that says otherwise. There cannot be a Quran that says that she actually left. If there is, that's an error. Just flat out. And I think it's a contradictory error because it's contradicting other parts of the Quran. And yeah, it's part of the Ten Qur'at, so it's a valid reading that has a mutawata chain that goes back to Muhammad. What that would mean is, if you accept that, Muhammad said in at least four of the places that Lot's wife didn't leave and stayed in Sodom and Gomorrah. And then in one narration, Muhammad said she left and she turned back. That's very problematic, as you can see. And Marin Van Putin, I think, points this out in this Twitter thread. I'll leave a link um, for this below so you guys can follow along and see as well. Let's watch this clip. <laughs> I think you can resolve a lot of these by by combining the meanings. I do think that that is a valid way of looking at this as a, as a way of solving this theologically. I think that is fair. I think there are readings that are that are contradictory, though. That um, isn't. So, for example, so if I gave you one, yeah, please we look at it. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to quote. Can I share my screen if that's all right? Yeah. Go ahead. Just because because I'm quoting a particular scholar. So, when I, when uh, I which one? Because I, um, I have also some here. Maybe maybe uh, I have it here also. Which one. So, can you see my screen? I think you may have to bring it up, actually. Yes. Um, there we go. Ah, thank you very much. There we go. So, let me take a look. Okay, so this is uh, Maren Van Putten. I believe you you quoted yeah. him. Uh, yeah, I know. On your, on your I know. Podcast. It's a friend, yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I'd love to meet him. Um, I know. He's yeah. obviously a very good scholar. Know. So, he basically points out that the story of Lot is repeated in the Quran in, in many different places, and he gives the different verses. Mm-hmm. And he, he says, okay, so there are parallels in Genesis 19, which is where we have it in our, in our scripture. And he has this thread here. And he says, it's been noted that a pivotal moment in the original story about Lot's wife is told quite differently in the Quran than how it is in Genesis. Fine. In Genesis, as uh, Lot and his family leave Sodom and Gomorrah, his wife looks back and turns into a pillar of salt. That's what we have in, uh, in the Bible. In the Quran, the pillar of salt is missing entirely. Yeah, that's fine. And generally, it's not the wife looking back that causes her perdition. Instead, she is said to be left behind or even decreed to be left behind. And it gives some verses here. But 1181 forms a confounding factor. And he has some screenshots of the different verses. So we can say 
except his wife. We are allowed to create that she is one of those who remain behind. Okay, so she remains behind. So we saved him and his family, except for his wife. We destined her to be of those who remain behind. So again, Lot's wife is not going with them as I leave. She is staying behind, except an old woman, by his wife, among those who remained with the evildoers, staying behind. And this one as well, except an old woman among those who remained behind. So the Quran is clear in many places that Lot's wife stayed behind. Now, what he goes on to explain is that there is a particular one, which is Surah 11, Ayah 81. There is a variant here, and you include it in your book, by the way. Um, it's written there as well. Here two angels come to warn Lot and command him to leave uh, his family and not turn around. After that, a phrase follows, which can be read in two different ways. And he gives it in Arabic. I'm not even going to pretend I can pronounce that well. Both mean accept your wife, but what is being accepted differs. The section consists of three phrases. So travel with your family during a portion of the night and let among you not one turn around, except your wife. Illa, except in positive sentences, is followed by the executive, uh, accusative, again, I'm not going to pronounce that, they prostrated except for a bliss. So he gives an example. But when accepting a negative sentence, it shows up in the normative, as in this, there is no God but Allah. So with this phrase, it accepts the, uh, it accepts, ex accepts, sorry, the positive phrase, so travel with your family except your wife, this is the majority reading. And then it gives two kala'at, read it, according to the rawiyah, illa, and then it goes on to say it, accepting the negative phrase, and not one of you shall turn around, except your wife. And then he says, clearly these two readings are difficult to unify. Either the wife did not travel along and stayed behind, or she went along and looked back. I have to. I, you have to tell me which ayah is it because I have to bring it in Arabic and judge. Oh, I'm not sure. going to judge. I cannot judge from translations. Translations at the end are a waste of exegesis. So when I translate, I'm explaining my own understanding. So the 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 the, the, the most important is or what distinguishes is the Arabic. So tell me, tell me, tell me which uh, which surah and which ayah. So it's surah eleven, ayah eighty one. Okay, Surah, so, Surah, uh, Surah Hud. Hud must be Surah uh, Hud. Yeah. Um, yep. Surah 11, uh, 81. Yep, yep. Okay. Let me just double check. I'm pretty sure that's right. Okay. Was it because... Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, Bismillah, I'm bringing it. No worries. Now this is Yunus. So if if Marin is correct here, we would say that this is a reading yeah. that seems to be saying two different things that can't both be the case. This is not going to happen, never. But let me see. Okay. Yeah, eighty-one. Yeah. قالوا يا لوط إن رسل ربك لن يصلوا إليك فأسر بأهلك بقطع من الليل ولا يلتفت منكم أحد إلا امرأتك إنه مصيبها ما أصابهم. Okay. Uh, how did I translate this? Uh, let me check it in my translation. Uh, Bismillah. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, Surat uh, Hud 81 here. They said, O oh Lord, we are the messengers of your Lord. They will not reach you, so take your family on a journey while yet a part of the night remains, and let none of you look back. But not your wife. She will be afflicted by that which afflicts them. It means that take your family, but you don't take your wife. If she wants to remain, let her remain. Right. So what Marin is saying is that there are two ways you can look at this based on yeah. the different uh, these two color ads. You can either yeah. say accept your wife is in the the same. Hang on, let me go to let me look at this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I show the same also. I show the same in the footnote that and let none of them look back except for your wife. Here means that if she insists, let her look. Halas, you, you can't do anything for her. But this one says if she insists to stay, let her stay. So here it's the angels are commanding Lut on what to do in the future. And they are telling him if she wants to remain, let her remain. And because she is destined to be with them. 
and to be to 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 uh, to be afflicted. And if she uh, insists to, if she goes out with you and she insists to look back, let her look back. She is at the end going to be afflicted. Beautiful. I don't see contradictions. So let's let's read what uh, Marin says here. So he says, so travel with your family, except your wife. This is the majority reading. So the majority yeah. reading is that go with your family, Lot, but not your wife. Your wife mm -hmm. is going to stay behind. Mm -hmm. And other Quranic verses, remember, there were quite a few other Quran verses that make it clear. And there is, to my knowledge, no Quran on them. It simply says that she stayed, but she also was killed. No, so, no, no. No, no, yeah. it means she was with them at the end. She ended up, she ended up like them, whether she stayed yeah. or she was punished, because at the end she did not leave the, the village. By the time they were about to leave the village, or by the time they just left the village, the punishment happened, which is like it is it is by the way discovered lately by NASA that it was like a meteor that exploded. Uh, about four kilometers above the, the, the earth in that area. And those who looked, probably that's what the scientists say, lost their sight before dying. So that's, subhanAllah, this is very, yani, very accurate from the Quran that you have to be behind your family to make sure that no one looks. But if the wife looked, she's gone with them. If she stayed, she's gone with them. We, we don't necessarily know. And by the way, the Quran not all, doesn't always give full details 100% and he leaves things for the mind to think about. The Quran, by the way, is a sure. book of guidance. It is not a book of history. It is not a registrar that registered history details at all. I agree, but it does make historical claims and we would assume that those are true, which I think <clears> is fair. We both agree there. So the issue here is that the majority reading says quite clearly that she did not go, and that's backed up by other Quran verses that have no Qur'at variant that also say she did not go. But then there is Qur'at on this verse where it says, and none of you shall turn around except your wife. In other words, the the but your wife part, the except your wife part, is being applied to those who turned around, not those who went. So in other words, this the negative, the minor reading is saying she did go, and then she looked around, and therefore she perished, presumably. We have we have to check the tafsirs and see what does it mean, fil ghabirin, fil ghabirin, that she did not really go, by the way. And this is one of the meanings of this ayah, that she did not even go, okay? Or does it mean that she is considered one of their group? So even if she leaves, she's going to be punished outside the village. I don't see contradiction, by the way. It just doesn't The contradiction would be, did she leave what happened. It doesn't tell us exactly what happened. Because here it's the, the angels yeah. are commanding him on what to do in the future. It's not the angels that are reciting something or telling him an, uh, 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 an event that happened in the past. I, I agree. This is talking future tense. It's explaining what will happen. Yes. But w is it saying that she will go and turn back or will she stay and turn back? And the reason why this, I think this is quite powerful and difficult is because there are other verses in the Quran that are clear, much clearer, that say she did not go. So how can there be a Qur'at reading that suggests not, that she did go? Not necessarily. That It doesn't necessarily mean that she did not go. It means that she is among this group that stayed. She is among the group that will be afflicted like that, which is the group of the villagers, the, the rest of the people. But not necessarily that she, that, that she will leave or not. So the issue is here that this, uh, this ayah does not even contradict that because one of their meanings is she may want to stay, let her stay, and she may want to go, and she wants to, she will want to look back, let her look back. She is in any way going to be punished like them. I don't see a contradiction still. Do you uh, have another well, this example is that's clear than this? Because this is not clear. Uh, the contradiction is not clear. Well, see, these are the Quran verses, right? Except his wife. We decree that she is one of those who remained behind. Okay, so this verse is saying she remained behind, quite clearly. So we saved him and his family, except for his wife. We destined her to be of those who remained behind. Again, very clear, she remains behind. Except an old woman, his wife, among those who remained. So she again remained. Except an old woman, among those who remained behind. And she remained. So these then she remained. Good. Okay, then, but there is a killer verses... that says that she did not because she turned around. She went with them and she turned around. No, 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 no. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The one that okay. says that she may go and want to look around, speaking about something in the future, 
but the others are speaking about things that happened that she remained and she remained okay for, i don't think we're, we're going to agree on this one in this next clip i'm talking about another contradiction and i think fidel probably saw that i was going to bring this one um it's surah 10 ayah 16 it's how Allah says that if Allah willed, he would have informed them about something. But there's a Qur'a that says, if Allah willed, Allah would have not informed them about something. So <clears throat> the ayah says, Here. had had Allah yeah. willed, I would not have mm -hmm. read it to you, and he would not have informed you about it. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on. But the yeah. variant says, and he would have informed you about it. So it's a... It's a literal negation. It's it, one saying something will and one saying something isn't. No, it doesn't say that. Listen to me. And I have it on the screen now, by the way. Yep. Uh, say, had Allah willed, which means that it's going to speak about something that did not happen. I would not have read it to you, which is the Quran, and he would not have informed you about it. That's one. Yeah. The second one is, had Allah willed, which is something also that did not happen, I would not have read it to you, and he would have informed you about it, which means through someone else. Somehow else. Somehow, like for example, here the prophet is saying, had Allah willed, neither he could have sent me as a prophet, nor even you were made aware of the Quran at all. Or, or, or he, he neither sends me as a prophet and he can make you aware of it. By the way, Allah could have sent the Quran to each one of us by revelation. Couldn't every one of us have got in touch with Jibreel and receive it like the Prophet Sallallahu But it would be too hard for us to do that. We want, the Prophet was suffering when he was receiving the Quran and then he calls for the uh, scribes and then he recites what he received. So here it is talking about two things. And you know what? I didn't like that when you read the second variation, you did not continue what I wrote, which is through someone else. Because like that's that... Is that in the Arabic though? No, 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 no. You are reading it. No, 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 no. But the, here, it, this is explanatory. It explains and says that Allah either could have sent, not sent me as a prophet, nor made you aware of the Quran at all, or Allah could have not sent me as a prophet and still made you aware of the Quran because he, can, he is indeed all powerful and he can do everything. But it's a blessing that he chose me and made me suffer in receiving it because it was downloaded on the prophet's heart. And then the prophet uh, uh, propagated it to us. So that's the blessing here. I don't see any contradiction between them. I guess I guess this has a historical context, right? This is referring to a conversation that happened. So either Muhammad was told to say, well, <clears throat> I guess I guess I have an issue with Muhammad saying two contradictory things. If he meant to say that these are both true in a sense, it would make more sense that he would just say that. Here he's basically saying. I'm revealing this this ayah, uh, this ayah in one way. I'm going to reveal it in another way that technically says the opposite. No, the opposite. Not the opposite. Another option. Well, okay, there it might be opposite. another option, but but the option is the opposite. It's not the opposite. So, so if I were to if I were to ask Muhammad, um, you know, had Allah willed, you would not have um, Muhammad would not have read it to you, but would. Would Allah have informed them about it? He would have had to tell me both yes and no. If I'm and talking about a past event, if I'm talking about a past event, then this would be a, a, a contradiction. But if I'm talking about a hypothetical event, and I, I tell you, I, I, I if I'm taking you somewhere to to, for example, if I'm taking my child, my, my my son to school, and I tell him, by the way. I could have been taking you now to somewhere else like a nightclub. Or I could have been taking you somewhere else like an archery club. There is no contradiction. I'm telling him about two things that did not happen. But the, the example here, it would be, you could say that to your son, but you could have also apparently said, did you know I could, be take, I could not be taking you to the archery club? Yeah. 
Yeah, which what, is what, just yeah. like, what? <laughs> That's It's the opposite in meaning. So could he have taken him to the archery club or could he not have taken him to the archery club? No, 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 no. no. Here he is saying, the, the case is, Prophet uh, Allah chose a person, a good man, and sent him the revelation and he and told him to propagate it. Okay, like he did always in every era. Jesus was given the gospel, told him to propagate it. And Jesus himself said that in the, in, the, in, the, in the Bible that exists in the hands of the Christians today, says, I don't make up things. Whatever I hear, I say. That's exactly what the Prophet Muhammad did, what Moses did on everything. But here the Prophet is telling them, and Allah is commanding him to tell them, there could have been two other scenarios. I think this is a. I think this is difficult. You will never, um, you will never this, find any contradiction in the Quran. Well, I, I think can't. these are contradictions. I mean, um, oh, no. if you oh, okay. if you think of it in the literal sense of so you're saying one thing and then you negate it in the same oh. verse, I think that's difficult. Ah, come on! And again, ah. I, don't, I don't think you can you can't say that the the Quran is preserved. I think you still can. I think you just can't say the Quran has been perfectly preserved. preserved. It's, it's God who preserved it. Thank God that he did not let us preserve it. But you see, uh, th that's, that's difficult. If Allah is the one who preserves his book, which th there's a there's ayah that says this, um, then why is Ibn Mujahid the one who standardizes what's acceptable Qur'at and what is not? No, but they were but he did not invent them. They were there. But he told but he people chose not, them. Yeah, he, yeah, because he they needed to be standardized. It's uh, the, the, the numbers of Muslims are growing. People are learning from each other. And there are definitely some ignorant people teaching. Until today, there are ignorant people teaching here and there. And we need to stop them by standardizing things, issuing books, telling people not to hear to ignorant people. That's, not, that's different. That's normal. That's normal. It's a scholarship. Right. But you see, what perfect preservation would mean is that there is one recitation that has been accepted by everyone. And everyone uses that recitation. That's what perfect would mean here. But because that's not what happened historically, and in fact, there was at least 25 different Qur'at that was in use, so you would have had imams giving, leading Salah, giving this their understanding of the Qur'at, which would have been incorrect, according to the scholars later on. Maybe Mujahid came and he said, no, this isn't correct. These are the ones that are correct. And then there were scholars that disagreed with him. And even he said there are issues with these recitations. And I can show you, I can show you uh, Marine Van Putin quoting that as well. It, it becomes difficult to see how this isn't just later scholars picking which recitations of the Quran they want and which ones they don't want. And this is why I said it's very important to me that in the Sunnah, if you can find something that says, I am reciting to you the Quran that I got from Jibril, who got from Allah, this, there are 10 recitations, take them from me and, and say them. But anything else, no. If you could show me that, I'll, I'll no, concede no, no. and I'll say, no, yeah, no, no. Muhammad says never so. said 10 recitations. It's we canonize, That's my point. we canonize them in... Ten recitations, but there are many, many. Uh, well, there is four thousand variations. Okay, some imams chose to read this with this, with this, with this. Okay, but some others chose other choices. But the variations are there, and it is known that even in the salah, if you read every ayah in a different uh, qira'ah, that's still acceptable because you did not make a mistake. You did not make a mistake. I don't think a hypothetical here really helps because it's still a contradictory hypothetical. In other words, and I kind of try and make this point, if you went up to Muhammad and you asked him, would Allah have informed them about something? He would have had to have said both yes and no, which I don't know how that's going to work without saying there's a problem. Uh, I think Muhammad was clear when he spoke or he would have been clear when he spoke. I think trying to say he said both things, he was saying yes and no. Suppose and remember, only some people knew some of the some of the sayings, and some people didn't know some of the sayings. At least if we go by the Aruf and apply that same standard to the Qur'at, I don't know, is that fair? But to say that some of the Sahaba thought that that would happen, and they would have been informed by Allah, and that some of the Sahaba would have been told by Muhammad also that that would not happen, they would not be informed. I think that's just a contradiction. Like I mean, to be perfectly honest, I'm just being honest here. I think that would be what we would call two-faced. If I said to some people, my favorite ice cream is coffee flavored ice cream, which it is, coffee flavored ice cream is lovely. And then I said to some other people, my favorite flavor of ice cream is not coffee flavor. I think I'm just telling people different things that can't be reconciled. And it kind of makes me sound like I just say 
what I want to different people. And that's why I think that this is problematic. And I think this is a contradictory term. And therefore the crown isn't perfectly preserved. Now the discussion also went into other things. He brought up some... Uh, some stuff regarding the the Trinity. How could God not know? Mark thirteen thirty two, Matthew twenty four thirty six. He brought up these kind of verses, but mm, I mean, I don't think Fidel is. I don't think that's his subject. So I'll include it in the full debate if you guys are interested in what he brought up regarding the Christian perspective and what I said in response. But it wasn't really to do with Christian preservation. It was more to do with the Trinity and how could God not know and, and that that kind of thinking. Overall, I think this is important. And I think it's important because we now have people of whom run Dara Institutes or are part of Dara Institutes that put out information to the public about Islam who have written works, very good works, may I just say, where the Quran is translated into the 10 different Qur'at in English for everyone to read. And the variations are included in the footnotes so we can all check for ourselves. We are able to see where there are difficult and often contradictory verses in the Ten Qur'at of the Qur'an. And the main thrust of what I was saying in this discussion is Muhammad never said the Qur'an is meant to be given in ten different readings. As far as I'm aware, I, ch I challenge any Muslim to show me authentic sunnah where Muhammad says, I am giving you the Qur'an in ten Qur'at. He never says this. The closest we have to this kind of thing is either partial stories about when Muhammad recited something differently, which again, okay, confirms that there are differences, but it doesn't tell you there's meant to be 10. And then you have the seven Aruf, which Fidel says is abrogated. I don't think that's really the case. Although I do think that if you accepted his understanding that the Aruf has been lost, then you have to accept that six out of seven different ways of reciting the Quran have been lost which means that roughly 85% of the Qur'an has been lost, if you look at it from a purely factual perspective, even if that is, according to Fidel, just dialogues. Dialogues? Dialects. What I think this is going to lead to is Muslims adopting the same position the Christians hold, that no major doctrine is affected by variants, that through manuscript tradition, we can affirm what the likely meaning originally was. I think that's eventually going to be the case, and I think perhaps scholars are taking steps to try to get there. Otherwise, you have the issue of your Quran technically wasn't standardized until centuries later, and it was standardized by men who were picking out a different possible options. And there's nothing that says these men were inspired or had perfect vision. You know, like they, they didn't know for definite. They were simply trying to infer which versions were better than others. Ibn Mujahid criticized his own Qur'at pickings, so did others. And then it was even expanded on centuries later. It went from seven to ten. Like, how does, how does that even work? I mean, that just seems like later scholars are saying, Mujahid, you got things wrong. You've confused everybody. Let's fix this. It wasn't seven readings Muhammad gave. It was ten. And it's like, okay, well, where did Muhammad say that? He didn't say that. Okay, so... Allah says in the Quran he's, he's going to protect his word, but he uses scholars to do this. I thought the entire point, and I hear this time and time again after, like from the Dara teams, is that Allah does not use scholars to preserve his word, because that's what he did previously for the previous revelations, and supposedly those revelations were then corrupted. So why is he relying on scholars to tell you what is Quran and what is not Quran, and why is he doing it centuries later, and why did Muhammad never tell us about the Ten Qur'at? It would have made things a lot easier if Muhammad had done exactly what he had done for the Aruf to the Qur'at and said, here are the different readings. These are the ones you're supposed to take. But he never did. And I find that I find that a very big sign that this is of human origin and not of divine origin. The Qur'at, I think, is fundamentally human. I think it's better explained by just being very slight variants and diacritical marks that change an Arabic structure substantially, as, as Fidel and I agree on. And therefore, it's just a it's just a variant. You know, people in different cities had different variants for their readings of the Uthmanic Codex. That's really what it boils down to. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching this video. I hope this uh, is informative and helps you understand exactly what the Islamic position is when people talk about perfect preservation of the Quran. I hope this makes you think twice about whether that's a good doctrine, whether that actually makes sense, or is it really more so that the Quran has just been preserved in a general sense? I think the best we can say it's been preserved in some general sense. And because of that, we should avoid falsehood and when a lot of scholars are trying to say something's perfectly preserved, when we can demonstrate quite conclusively it isn't, we should abandon that. And it should make us think about whether or not we're really on the right path here, or do we need to start looking outwards? And if you do, ladies and gentlemen, think that's where this is leading to, I would consider you to think about our Lord Jesus Christ, to look into what he taught, to look into how we know what he said what he said, and to adopt a more realistic and historical account of the person of Jesus Christ. God bless you all. I hope you have a great day. Take care.